up on Mother's Day for belonging and belonging. Uh, Mother's Day, because mothers are the first in our lives, uh, in the normal circumstances of things, that begin to teach us about we belong to someone. We belong. We belong to this woman who feeds us, who cares for me, who takes care of me. Not that dads are out of the picture. Sometimes it takes a couple of years before the, uh, you know, the attention turns to and uh, holds on to daddy for a while. But uh, mother is the first one that gives us that sense of we belong now to a family. And there's that, that uh, holding, that nurturing, that, that uh, comforting, that taking care of. Uh, it's one of the things they found in uh, orphanages where the children, if they don't have someone to come and hold them, they have a great deal of difficulty uh, in adjusting to life and being without the normal family situation. But if they have you know, particular caregivers that can hold the, the babies and comfort them and, and take care of them like a mother, a substitute mother, uh, then they find adjustments a little bit better. It's a part of God's design for us to belong and to be a part of. That's what Jesus says he is in this prayer, in his great high priestly prayer, we call it, from John chapter 17. Uh, what we're getting today is the third part of that prayer. The first part, he prays for himself, as this is the night before he is going to die on the cross. And then he prays for his disciples. And then we have today's text, which includes not only the disciples, but also those who hear the word of the gospel that comes from the disciples as they become apostles. And those who then read their words. All of those who, because of the apostles, the disciples, then uh, are a part of the family of God. We belong to the family of God through the words of them. This belonging. It's a part of, you know, God wants us to belong to him. He wants all of us to be a part of his family. He wants all humanity to be a part of his family. Problem is, most of them don't want to be. Okay. But God has always had this family concept, this belonging, having special places and special people. When the disciples, as they were, uh, this was after the ascension, which was celebrated this last Thursday, as the uh, 40th day after Easter, as the, the ascension, the disciples were in Jerusalem then, and the, the leadership began to talk about, you know, we need to replace Judas. As you, as you were reminded, uh, uh, Judas, unlike Peter, who had behaved as if he was not belonging to the disciples on that night in which Jesus was arrested, as Peter professed he had absolutely no knowledge, no relationship. He did not even know Jesus and swore that he did not know the man. Judas also, we think more of the betrayal of Jesus as he revealed to the arresting authorities where they could find Jesus without the threat of the public hindering them from taking Jesus into captivity. Now, both these men betrayed Jesus. Both of these men acted as if they were not a part of the family. You know, the same kind of thing that we do, maybe not that severely, but every day, when we don't act like members of God's family, where we live, where we work, where we play, where we are, when we are not acting like God's children that he has declared us to be, then we are also betraying Jesus. Now the difference between Peter and Judas was that Peter confessed his sin to, to Jesus and Jesus absolved him of his sins. He received forgiveness of his sins. 
Not that there were not residuals. As we talked about, later, after his ascent, or before his ascension, Jesus came to Peter and said, Peter, do you love me? And he says, you know I do. And for each time that Peter had denied Jesus that one particular night, as Jesus said he would do before the rooster crowed, three times Jesus asked him, do you love me? And each time Jesus responded, feed the family, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed the family. So Peter was drawn back into the family as a leader in the family. Unlike Judas, who believed that there was no forgiveness at all possible for someone like him for what he had done in betraying Jesus. And so he went out and killed himself. No hope for him. Not even Jesus could forgive him. Is what he believed incorrectly. God wants even the Judas Iscariots in his family. And as long as we're alive in time, every sinner has an opportunity to be a part of God's family. Well, are you going to give me that litany? But how about those that have not heard? Well, they have not heard because we have not sent. Because we've not, you know. Okay. Well, that's our job. That's our job now is to get the word out that God wants everybody to be a part of his special family. Yeah. Like all of our families, there's a lot of different branches. And that's what in the gospel lesson this morning when we look at that and we think, you know, how often we have prayed like Jesus has. Oh Lord, why can't we all be one holy Christian apostolic church in the entire world? Why are there so many different branches? Not even like the Roman Catholic, Eastern Catholic, you've got uh, all the different kinds of Protestants. You've got hundreds of different kinds of Lutheran churches in the world. And on and on and on. So, and, and it's not good for the witness of the gospel in the world. Because they look at you and say, even you guys can't agree amongst each other as to what the Bible says. Suffice it to say, I think that there is not any group of any size in the world that there is not a disagreement amongst them as to what they believe, teach, confess, and condemn, either in actions or in beliefs or however process system. And you know what the amazing part as us as Christians is that God gets his work done through us anyway. Yes, it might be better. It might be more unified. It might be more effective. It might be more powerful. But God works through his gracious gifts anyway, in spite of us, but with us and through us, because that's the way God works. Because we belong to him. We belong to him. That's what the disciples, as they picked one to, to take his place, to take Judas's place. And they had criteria. You know, they had to have been someone that had seen everything from the beginning and seen Jesus die and be buried and rise again to life. And out of all of that, they only came up with two guys that met that criteria perfectly. And then they cast lots and chose Matthias. And he came forth to take Judas's place. Because 12 was a good number. It was a, a number that, that you know, like the 12 tribes of Israel. It's the complete number of people. This is the complete package of disciples. And when he listed the number of, of people that were there, when they made this, uh, drew this casting of lots, there were 120. Okay. That was another multiple of 10, of 12, 12 times 10. We talked about the 100 in heaven, there's going to be 144,000 in heaven. <clears throat> That's 12 times 12 times 12. That's the way they worked with numbers. It's a complete number. Yeah. And so they, they, in their sight, in their system, 
They made it complete by electing Matthias to fill it. That was the rules, that was the understanding, that was the groundwork of their organization in that early grouping of things. As we've heard, dissension even in the early New Testament church between those who were Jewish Christians and those who were from outside the church and coming in as Gentiles to now be Christians. And those who said, well, they have to become a good Jew first before they can be a, a Christian. And Paul and Peter got into a debate in Jerusalem to help straighten Peter out, who again had strayed a little bit from the family that God had established in Christ Jesus. Well, this belonging to the family of God, this is how Christ makes us one. And in spite of the fact that we do not disagree or do not agree in all points with all of those who profess to be Christians in the Christian church, the scriptures tell us that everywhere that the scriptures are taught, are read, are exposed to, the truths of God come forth. So that even those who are members of a faith group that we don't agree with totally, that we're not in pulpit and altar fellowship with, if the word of God is being studied and taught and heard in their midst of their churches, we believe that that word has power and changes people into belonging to the family of God. That's the power of God. That in spite of our divisions, in spite of our disagreements within the context of the family of God, God still works his grace to give the forgiveness to as many as he can. That's God's great grace, his blessings to us. And we belong to him. As Jesus says, he is in us, we are in him, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Next week, we could focus on, as we will in just a moment, <clears throat> with Luther's explanation to the third article of the Apostles' Creed, where he talks about how the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, sanctifies, and keeps us in the one holy Christian church. He holds us and keeps us. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is talking with God the Father. When the Holy Spirit came, then the disciples began to understand the Trinity. They began to understand why we baptize in the name, as Jesus said, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We began to understand how Jesus, when he said, you know, this is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. This for the forgiveness of sins. We begin to understand what all of that means by the power of God as he sends his Holy Spirit to us. And as the Spirit comes to us, as the scriptures say, in baptism, he gives us the Holy Spirit as a down payment on our eternal life. And then we begin to not only have that feeling of belonging, that's a feeling that, that everyone seeks. Well, there's some odd folks that are so fed up with, with being forced to belong that they become a hermit. You know, they go off totally on their own. There are others that, you know, have a belonging, but it is so painful, they sometimes want to not belong for a while. It's amazing how sometimes people who belong to a church and are tremendously active are overly active sometimes and then they have to get away and not belong because they have been worn out. This belonging is a difficult process. When we belong, we understand that there are implications for our belonging. First, there are implications for our belonging to the family of God. He has declared us to be his child. There are implications for that. 
He expects you to live like it. When we join a congregation, there are implications to that, either spoken or unspoken. Expectations. Because the realization that God has given the membership to the fellowship of a church so that that church body can get done what God wants them to do in their area. And the scriptures are very clear that he gives us every gift we need to do that. But it's interesting how people come and people go. And people ooh, fall away for a while and come back. And people, they are present every Sunday for a while and then they're not present always so faithfully. There are those that are get involved and teach Bible studies and all sorts of activities and are leading those activities for a great deal of, what, great deal of time. And then all of a sudden, you know, they kind of move away and kind of... You know, sometimes when people go away, I, it's a great rejoicing on my part when finally, and sometimes it takes years, but I get a letter or an email now and I say, by the way, Pastor, uh, we have now begun to attend, you know, whether they've moved away and have now found a church home or whether they've moved out of the neighborhood or whether they have just moved their presence someplace else. And I get a message and it says, we have found fellowship with another portion of the body of Christ, another church of our own denomination or maybe another faith group. And they found another place to be the Christian child that God has declared them to be. Because belonging is what God wants from us. That's what the cults, you know, they, they understand that, that need for people to feel like they belong, that they have a purpose. And so they play on that and they manipulate it till they can take all of the resources of someone who feels unbelonging. And if they can reach into the resources of that individual's family, they will take it all. God gives us all that we have. And he gives it to us so that we might be belonging to his family and using all of his resources as stewards and because we have received everything from God, including our forgiveness, including the word and sacraments that strengthen us to be the children of God he has declared us to be, we are longing for Christ's return. We are longing for that perfection of heaven that we don't have here on earth. We're longing for that. And that's what John closes out the book of Revelation as he ends it with what is most of us use as a, a meal prayer. You know, Come, Lord Jesus. We add to that and be our guest and let these gifts to us be blessed. Or whatever variation of our uncommon table prayer that we use. Right. But that come, Lord Jesus, is a central part of it. As we are being longing for Christ's return. Because our job is finished when that happens. All of those who are supposed to be in heaven will be there. All of those who are to be saved will be saved. And it is done. How much longer that's going to take? We see signs always. The disciples thought it was any moment. Yeah. They said, hey, we better write this stuff down. There's not too many of us left to tell this story. And they wrote it. 2,000 years later, we're still reading their words. And those words are expanding the family of God. Expanding the children. And he puts us into fellowships so that we can nourish one another like mothers nourish their children. Nourish them until we can take the positions of responsibility positions of sharing and it's amazing how often the children 
I think one of the kids this morning was excited because this is the year that she can be a leader in Vacation Bible School. She can be one of the kids helping guide the others from one place to another. Boy, is she excited, right? It's fantastic, you know, as we see our children grow and we see newcomers grow in their fellowship and taking of responsibility in the congregation. You know, that's why we have this fellowship. By the way, tonight's topic at Sharing Christian Faith is koinonia or ecclesia. It's the church. What is the one holy Catholic or Christian apostolic church? What is it? And how does God work his will through that church into the world today? May God bless you and strengthen you as we receive from him the peace in the midst of all of this turmoil of this world. As we belong to him and then we be longing for his return so that we can as he has promised, as he has given us a down payment in the Holy Spirit at baptism, be with him in heaven forever. Where it is all perfect. It is all done. It is all finished. There are no more to-do lists that we are required to get done. We don't know how it's going to work out, but what a joy. And we know it's going to be so perfect and that we're going to be there because, hallelujah, Christ is risen. Jesus. Oh,